Welcome to this UNF Plus debate on gender equality in EU labour markets. Our programme today is presented within the Citizens' Corner concept. The debate is produced and hosted by UNF Plus and HRT Croatia, public service radio, a member of the UNF Plus network. The debate can be followed live in the European Parliament on the UNF Plus Inside website, on our Facebook profile, as well as on Twitter using the hashtag Citizens' Corner EU. I'm Brian Maguire. Joining us today to discuss gender equality in the EU's labour market, Malin Bjork, MEP from Sweden, the United Left, Manuela Galeng uh, from the European Commission's Director General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion, Vladimir Drabalova, Member of the European Economic and Social Committee, and also joined by our student today, Sunchana Duricha, a student from a radio student at Zagreb in Croatia. I'm Brian Maguire. And uh, our first question to uh, Malin Bjork today. Uh, Malin, what do you think the real challenges uh, are for Europe in dealing with uh, gender equality and the labour market? Markets. Well, I think the, <coughs> the issues faced in the labor market are, are, are long-standing, so uh, even though I'm one of the most hard-working optimist ones, I don't think we will solve them within this legislature. However, I do see that there is continuous discrimination of women in the labor market, uh, uh, and there is segregation in the labor market, there is pay discrimination, which is extremely serious, and I can't believe that we are in 2017 now, and not more is being done at European level, but also at national levels to combat pay discrimination. And what it also results in is the, the poverty of older women. So if we have a pay gap, we have an even bigger pension gap. Uh, and we look at uh, poverty to situations in, in Europe today that are actually increasing. It is uh, very largely a, a, f a female phenomena. So it's uh, single parents, mostly women, and older women that have very, very low pensions. So uh, in terms of, of gender, equality in the, in the labor market. It is such a key issue for gender equality overall that we really have no time to waste. Momela well, Galang, what is the Commission doing to address these issues? Well, uh, there are several instruments to, uh, to, to support uh, women on, uh, on the labor market. Of course, we need to design uh, employment and social policies in a way that they support uh, uh, employment of, of women, but of course we need to say also equ equally that employment and social policies fall mostly in the remit of, of member states. Having said that, we have several instruments. We have funding instruments that support the conciliation of um, work and private life, uh, the access to uh, social services, uh, child care. We have um, set targets for childcare, the so-called Barcelona targets, and we have the European semester that monitors the situation of uh, em the economy and the uh, social uh, policies in Europe every year. And there we have uh, many types highlighted uh, um, through country-specific recommendations, weaknesses in the area of uh, female uh, labor market. Uh, Okay, Vladimir, Drabalova, thank you. I, Vladimir, the, from employers' perspectives, do they see an economic advantage in discriminating against women, or is it better for everybody and for the growth of GDP that women face parity within the, the labor market? No, definitely I am representing employers' companies, and uh, we are just affecting uh, um, uh, lack of uh, skilled people on the labor market. So definitely we would like to see many uh, women uh, on the labor market and to increase participation and their activity, because uh, in contrary, it is lost of, uh, of talents. But on the other hand, we, I am very positive because uh, the last results uh, uh, showed uh, that uh, there are many positives. The, the participation of women uh, uh, on the labor market is increasing. Also, the participation in decision-making bodies is increasing slowly. Uh, and uh, I think that we should focus uh, particularly on segregation in education and labor market. And also, uh, uh, f um, for example, uh, uh, women uh, entrepreneurship. But uh, to, to conclude my first intervention, I would like to say that uh, the, the uh, legislative and instrument uh, uh, at EU level uh, are coherent, so it is not necessary to develop the other or further uh, legislation. So we have to go through both positive examples. Do you think that simply there's a matter of implementation of existing? Definitely, definitely. I think that uh, there are still gaps, 
but it is necessary to better uh, implement and to better enforce. Madam Burke, do you think that the implementation is really the issue or is there something more to it than that? Well, I think when you have a piece of legislation that doesn't deliver, you, you should examine what needs to be changed. And I'm hope, hopefully the Commission is doing just that because that's what the European Parliament has asked for. So, uh, in, in, but in terms of, of uh, the general uh, attitude from, some, from parts of the, of the society and from parts of the employers, there are very differences there also, is that let this take time, it's difficult, it's hard, but I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to wait for until my grandchildren maybe one day will be paid only 10% less of, of, uh, of men. So, you know, I think we owe to our citizens in Europe to, to take action now. And, and, and uh, what was raised here by, by the Commission representative is the issue of care services. I think this, it's an investment. Why is the states and the public authorities and the European funding not investing? The Barcelona targets, they have been there since 2002, I think or you know, the Commission can correct me about the years, but nothing is being done. They are not measured sufficiently, they are not being invested in, and I think that is in itself, it's, it's, um, it shows the, the lack of, of commitment to, to equality in the labor market. Okay, so do you have a question for the panel? Well, yes. Uh, actually, uh, I'm glad that you ma mentioned that uh, actually a uh, big difference between work and private life, and often uh, those things uh, um, not fairly uh, goes to w women. So um, I'm wondering what is your opinion about unpaid housework, which uh, mostly affects women? Mel, let's start with this. Do you think this is something that should somehow be compensated for? No, I don't think that unpaid housework should be paid for, but then you can have different calculations that make sure that women do not end up like poor pensioners in every time. What we do need is to change this dinosaur uh, society that, that prevails, where men do not take responsibility, fathers do not uh, do fathering, because it's, in, it's, a, it's an activity, you take care of your children, you have children, you take care of them. And as long as men do not step in and become full, fully caretakers as women, we will have this inequality not only at home, but also in the labor market. Let so they're extremely connected. Uh, Vladimir, do you think that employers have responsibility here to change men's working conditions to make them at least have the opportunity to be better fathers? I think that this question for for both uh, for both men and women, I think that it is question of flexible uh, a new form of uh, flexible form of work and flexible arrangement of working time. And please, we are speaking about work life balance. There are two words. So and it is about balance. It must be uh, in favor of uh, parents and in favor of companies. So it is uh, the best solutions are always uh, on company, at company level. So, so because the, the, the work uh, starts to be individualized, so we have uh, to take individual solutions. So uh, please uh, let it on uh, companies. The idea that women could finish with a 39% gap, 39% less in their pension mm. at the end, there must be some way to correct that. Mm. Yeah, in, uh, in, indeed. I think uh, there, is a, there is a lot we, we, that can be done. Of course, there are personal and cultural choices, but I think it's a task of public policy to ensure that uh, a choice, a real choice, can be, can be made. And therefore, I think uh, what we are currently looking at uh, at the European Commission level is uh, for a new initiative, which will be called Work-Life Balance, which looks at how to make uh, a more gender balanced, uh, to how to ensure a more gender balanced take up of, of working and leave arrangements. We see, for example, that flexible working arrangements are mostly taken up by women or uh, parental leave is mostly taken up by women. Why is this so? We need to better understand what are the drivers for this and to see wh how, what we can do to address uh, these shortcomings. Madame Bjork, do you see benchmark examples across Europe, those countries that do this much better or exactly as it should be done? Nobody probably does it exactly as it should be done, but it's clear that there are examples that are much 
<clears throat> more successful. And for example, in some of the Nordic countries where you have an, a parental leave arrangement which allows fathers to take that responsibility at home, it changes the whole power balance, the whole structure of how you combine work and private life. And in, in that sense, to say that it's an individual issue, leave it to the company, leave it to the individual women, let them become entrepreneurs, let's say, let them be flexible. For me, that is, that is empty talk. We need laws that enable uh, for more, more equal sharing of, of care um, responsibilities and against discrimination and pay discrimination in the in, But in, do you think there's work. also a leadership element in this, uh, this, the Nordic examples you mentioned? Was there a set of uh, characters that established this is the way it should be done? Joe Biden, for example, one of the first things he did in, in office as vice president was to send a letter to all his employees saying, I don't want you to miss any birthdays, I don't want you to miss any family occasions. And he, he said this from the top, he said, I, you do this and I will be deeply unhappy with you. So from a very personal but leadership position, instilling within his team, these are the values that you hold for your family, for your workplace. Definitely. And that's what I mean, you know, like, you can have uh, influence if you do that as a prime minister, as a vice president, or, some, or even as a big company leader. Uh, and it is your, your duty, I would say. It's not an optional thing. Of course, you should, should promote that. But in the end, you, you know, we also have to make bold political decisions about combating the pay gap, investing in, in, in child care and other care services, in making parental leave regulations work for both fathers and mothers. And we also have to say that, that this, is, this is not an individual problem. It, it is a structural inequality problem. So, Jenny, another question? Yes, I have a question. So, uh, actually, I think when we talk about gender inequality and labor market, and I think one of the major problem is also um, connected with education. So there is a lack of women women in STEM area. So how to solve this problem? Uh, it is up. Uh, it is um, true. Uh, I spoke about segregation in mm -hmm. education, and we, as employers, we would like uh, to see uh, STEM skilled uh, women on the labor market uh, because uh, the economic uh, performance of women is uh, really high. Uh, but um, uh, it is also about uh, skill. Uh, mismatch. So about uh, skills uh, which are provided by education system and skills which are needed in companies. So it is about, for example, speaking about STEM areas, it is about maths. And in case that uh, uh, in, uh, uh, at the national level, for example, in Czech Republic, the mathematics is not obligatory in many schools. We can hardly say, uh, women, please uh, uh, be focused on, on STEM areas, STEM studies. So, so it is necessary to start already in, kind in kindergarten and, and uh, from the beginning of the education system. Yeah, maybe it all starts with uh, prejudice and the stereotypes which are like uh, connected <coughs> with society. L let's, well, let's ask with the stereotypes yeah. and, and how we address from nursery school up, as, as Lamira says. The commission doesn't have prerogative over the education system. So how can you influence this transition to uh, a broader 21st century cultural dynamic which feeds the economy? Well, first of all, I think if we think that the cost of inequalities between women and men has been estimated by a Eurofund study uh, to be three, 370 billion euro uh, uh, in 2013, uh, that is 2.8% of the EU's GDP. It's, it's, uh, it's a cost to, to society, so we have the best educated uh, female, um, uh, best educated ever women, and it's, uh, it's really a waste of, of our resources if they are not on the labor market. And I think um, we need to make sure that they are involved in all areas of economic uh, of, of the economy, not uh, and that they enter into the science area, uh, because this is where there are many many jobs. Um, but we also may need to make sure that once they are in the labour market, they make a good career progression, and because they often get on and off or they have career breaks. Uh, their career progression is often less good than that of men. Do you think entrepreneurship is a particularly tough route for women to follow then? Because you can't just give up your business to go and look after the children in the same way perhaps you could take time out from a structured professional career. 
Well, I think um, many, many women have gone into entrepreneurship ex precisely because it allowed them to better uh, organize their uh, life, uh, lifestyle. Uh, on the other hand, I think we need to encourage entrepreneurship as such in, uh, uh, in Europe. But it's true that we have many less, less uh, women entrepreneurs in Europe and that there is a particular need to, um, to, f to foster that. Okay, Vladimir, employers would seem to be at odds on the face of it with entrepreneurship, with new competition, but actually employees benefit directly from the innovation that startups particularly bring to, to the economy. So as an employer, how do employers view this uh, adaption that they would benefit from the skill set of more entrepreneurial women in uh, European society? Uh, I think that uh, we uh, don't understand it as a competition. I think that it is uh, good uh, to promote uh, female entrepreneurs, only 30% in Europe uh, of uh, entrepreneurs are, are uh, uh, women, so, so I think it is one solution. And it is not forever, uh, it is necessary to, to support basic skills for all for men and women, and uh, to give uh, them options during the whole uh, life cycle to be employer, employees and to be entrepreneurs. Madam Bjork, does that pre-necessitate a, a structural support across Europe which allows you to adapt your career, that at one point you're in a structured job and the next you are able to go into uh, an entrepreneurial environment and then perhaps to uh, raise a child and then go back into one of these other options. Do we need to have a baseline which allows people to adapt in this kind of economy, bearing in mind that many of the jobs that exist today won't exist in 20 years' time and that the automation of society is going to make it even more challenging to fill uh, the, 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 the workforce? Well, I think, you know, I, I will... I do think that we are a little bit on on a wrong track when we say that it's all about entrepreneurship, it's about the you know, flexibility, and that also it's also to women to build that into their careers because the care needs are there as long as we have children, as long as we have elderly people. So I think the baseline what we need is that there is care services mm -hmm. for old people, for people that need care for children. And then we can start to think, how do we organize society to better have this work-life balance? Well, I think a feminist demand since very, very many years is shorted work hours. Six hour working day. Given the kind of surplus that we have, have, have generated the last 40 years, how come we haven't shortened the work hours? Because, the, and for me, it's just a problem of uh, ill redistributed surplus. It should have been invested in care services and in shortening the work uh, hours. And then we could have both women and men having this kind of flexibility in their life. But it has to be not fallen as an individual responsibility at every time in your life. Uh, sit there and, and organize. And it becomes a very much of a class issue also. We have very, very uh, many women that are suffering under uh, decreased labor rights and, and austerity policies. And, and they are left alone to, to, to do the caretaking and to organize their life. Uh, I don't know what they think about the demanding them to be even more flexible or entrepreneurial. I think it's you know, actually an insult to them. Do you think that there will come a moment, and they'll not do this in the future, where governments will <coughs> simply have to redistribute this work environment just to have a sustainable workforce? Because automation is going to take away millions of jobs across Europe. And democratically, and for a sustainable society and how people measure the wealth of uh, the value of their lives, do you think that in that moment the whole game changes? Yes, I do think because I think this is the future. The future is not to work, you know, to to work more. The future is to increase the quality of work and the quality of you, the time you don't work, and that means that we also, we have to rethink this. Uh, but that demands a certain level of public services that functions and a secure social security system that delivers. Okay, Manuela, the, the future scope that the Commission has, it doesn't look that far ahead, but how, how are we preparing for a more automated society where the working hours are going to change, the transition uh, to a different style of life is going to change, where the care needs of a growing elderly population are going to become what some would say a burden, others would simply say is our responsibility mm. to deal with. How, how are you lining these policies up? Okay, we have just had one full year of, of discussions going on at, at uh, European, but also at national and local level under the so-called um, 
Euro, uh, European pillar of social rights uh, initiative and yesterday was exactly the day where uh, there was a, a conference here in Brussels that concluded on, on the discussion because indeed, as you say, uh, we need to have a discussion on the future of work, on the future of social protection system and, and then see what are the principles that should be guiding us in future to go for a upward social convergence, not to look uh, to, to improve and perform uh, better so as to be capable to manage the big changes that are coming on up, be they globalization, digitalization, um, the fact that you will have uh, to change jobs several times in, uh, in your lifetime. The, Vladimir, on the very basic perception, as an employer, you'd want to pay people the lowest possible wage. Why is the workplace not filled with women then? I don't understand now the question. Well, the, the pay gap is so massive that uh -huh. surely you want to have more women in the workplace and get rid of all the expensive men. I can tell you that uh, that uh, this pay gap uh, is understood uh, as a lack um, wrongly, as a lack um, of um, pay for equal work. But it is uh, it is more more com uh, complex issue. I think that this equal pay for equal equal work is just at the company level is already uh, implemented applied. So, so this gap, general gap, is uh, very uh, is more complex. Let's say. Malengok, do you think it's equally applied? No. <laughs> That's a little predictable. So why not? <laughs> no, I, I I do think that you know we, we do have boys clubs that decide on the salary setting and uh, etc. And we can see that, uh, um, example, even in no the Nordic countries where you have you know more infrastructure, care services, and. Um, better, not not fully functioning uh, social security system, but better. Uh, even there, you know, the the big gap in inequality uh, in the work uh, uh, comes when uh, a couple has uh, have children. So after that, you know, the the, the, the it starts to be uh, develop a, um, this inequality in the workforce and at home. So it's very it's it's. Um, uh, there there is a there is a logic to that that we have to break. Okay. So, I mean, also on contracts as well. Do you see across Europe a, a different attachment to the enforcement of contract rights? For example, that I know in the UK, for example, people would feel less intimidated about arguing about the content of a gender contract, whereas in other countries, the more macho a society, the less likely you are to even consider doing that. Uh, do you mean working contract yes. uh, at the company level? In company, uh, uh, in the future, it was already said, in the future we will have uh, in one company, for example, 10, 20 different uh, contracts. So, so uh, from this reason, we are asking for for uh, for more flexibility because it is not uh, uh, because uh, we are we are expecting big big changes uh, in the world of work. It was clearly said it uh, in uh, in November there uh, was uh, a big conference in uh, the European Economic Social Committee together with ILO about these changes, and they are so dramatic and drastic that it is not possible to uh, to to make any rigid rules and to to make uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, categorize the, the contracts so from this reason we as employers we are calling for uh, for flexi uh, flexibility and on the other hand i fully support that uh, one of the solution is uh, to uh, increase the number of uh, child and care facilities and many member states are now addressed by the european commission with this uh, specific uh, country recommendations and they are reluctant to, to, to do it. So this is also the way because uh, I'm also I'm uh, representing not only employers but I am also a woman and I am also a mother so I know very well that in case uh, that uh, one uh, woman should uh, work effectively uh, at the workplace and in, uh, in the office they have to be sure that their children are cared. Mamala Galang, how do you how do we address this? Do, is this something which you know, how do you penalize countries which don't enforce or implement the recommendations that are so clearly needed? Well, there is no sanction to the country specific recommendations, let's be clear. But uh, um, 
if we look uh, at positive examples, we have seen that after several years that the Commission asked uh, uh, that the Commission, sorry, the, the European Union, because it's finally the Council that uh, uh, adopts uh, these country-specific recommendations uh, to have um, access to childcare um, um, to, to Malta, for instance. Now Malta introduced in 2014 uh, universal child child care so it is really an incredible uh, measure uh, that uh, can uh, will really have uh, uh, an impact so uh, it is possible to change of course what is requested uh, from member states in this country specific recommendations cannot be done overnight so we cannot expect changes right away but I think the fact that this uh, these comments are made year by year. It creates also uh, some pressure on uh, on member states to see how they can solve uh, the issue. You mentioned that there is support from funding as well in different yes. areas. So the, the, the withholding of that funding should certain criteria not be implemented, at least as a soft political measure to, to persuade or to encourage the uptake of, of better standards. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, the, the current, uh, the current uh, regulations of the structural and investment funds foresee that w if uh, uh, a member state hasn't foreseen sufficient funding to support a country-specific recommendation, a member state has, can uh, be asked uh, to amend the program to put sufficient funding to address that weakness that had be has been identified. So far, however, we haven't had uh, the case okay. yet. So, should I another question? Well, yes. Uh, Actually, it was uh, on the way uh, to this, uh, what we actually talked about. Because uh, when we talk about labor market in European Union, then, of course, one complication is that not all countries have the same law, the same policies. Uh, so the question is how to cope with that and how to like uh, make all countries uh, uh, adopt laws which are uh, labor laws, which are like gen gender sens sensitive. Yeah, Malin Bork, let me put this to you. The Commission could name and shame, couldn't it? It could bring this really back down to the member state level, to the citizens level and say, this is what we think is good for your country, but your government won't do it. It wouldn't be very popular. Would it be effective? I think what it would be effective is that you, to follow up the recommendation with, you know, an instruction to, to increase the investment in those areas. And so far, I mean, we wanted a, even, let's say, more direct uh, um, um, uh, provisions in the regulations of the structural funds to enable that kind of action but the, the provisions are there as described and I think they should be used basta. Uh, what I do think that I want to add here is that uh, we speak about the labor markets evolving and, and uh, uh, as it was like natural law <laughs> Let's be clear, we have very different visions on how we would like the labor market and the society to develop. That's why I'm, I'm in politics. I want labor rights to be reinforced. I don't want to see in one working place 15 different contracts. I don't think it's good for equality in Europe. I don't think it's good for gender equality. And these SMS contracts or precarious contracts, it's not a good thing for gender equality in the labor market. It is always women that bear the blunt of, of, of that kind of uh, discrimination between workers. So it's, there's no natural law. We have to fight for having good working conditions and for having good societal organization of care. And we have to work for, uh, for uh, these things, uh, both at national level, but also at European level. Vladimir, would transparency of contracts as a requirement go some way to solving this problem? Uh, do you mean transparency in uh, the uh, to be uh, that uh, the, the each uh, contract is uh, secured or uh, so yeah, for example say uh, a company with over 20 employees had to formally publish if not the names of the on the contracts the status of the job with the contract and that that would be measurable so that you would know that the, your colleague sitting beside you was on this uh, this no, I think that it is uh, it is up to human resources manager. It is uh, very challenging for them for the future to 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 make this all this con to manage all these contracts and to make them transparent, for to 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 be sure that uh, everything is is under the control and that they are not uh, that every contract uh, has uh, also this uh, social security base. So so I think that. Well, how, why is it, Manuel? 
why is it so difficult to have transparency of contracts given that a company has to equate the value of what it gives its employee with the value of the return on the work. And a lot of the time, especially for lower sector jobs, that's really a matter of calculation, calculating units of calls answered, meals served, floors cleaned. You know, is there some, some problem with implementing transparency? Um, well, I, I think uh, this is one of the issues that have been discussed uh, under, under the social pillar that I, I mentioned just before, because I think what we see now is that we see different types of, of, uh, of contracts and under some type of contracts, access to social protection is, is not foreseen. So we have workers that have all the rights, all the type of coverage, uh, that exists in, in member states and others that are totally outside of that system. And I think it's important to have um, to reflect how we can address, uh, address uh, uh, these issues. Okay, let's talk about retirement age. The chances of some of us around this table retiring <laughs> within any side, this side of 70, never mind 80 as, as time goes on, is diminishing. So how do we manage a workforce which is compelled to stay and work and make all these adjustments for health care, for, uh, for, for individual care, for child care, for contract. How do you manage that kind of destabilization of the workforce, Marilyn? Well, once again, I think, you know, we, I, I am in this <coughs> political work in order for us to, to realize different, different visions that we have. I don't think that there is a solution to, to a higher general working um, time, you know, or um, working time or working age and there are professions and very many professions that women are in so that uh, care, care um, uh, work for, for elderly and for you know, people for, with care needs uh, it, it is quite heavy work and uh, and physically uh, there are and, and there are also many male um, sectors where where you cannot work until you're 65 you cannot maybe not even work until you're 60 in certain professions and I think we we have to acknowledge that we have to have social security systems that allow for that uh, and and that kind of flexibility yes but not put the flexibility on the person to be responsible but we certainly have to organize for better uh, accommodating the fact that different professions also have very different uh, perspectives in, in uh, for the how long they can work. Vladimir, uh, last question for you. Is is the reality that some of us are going to be working till our 70s and maybe even 80s as, as time marches on, how do employers view this? Is this uh, something which they dread in terms of managing or do they simply have more opportunity to to change the workforce? Um, I think that it is very individual issue uh, because uh, in uh, some sector the people can work uh, till 70, let's say, but uh, there are sectors with, uh, where it is not, uh, not possible. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that uh, um, uh, employers have to, let's say, uh, work with all uh, people, all workers. So we have, uh, so from this reason, we, we say that the labor market have to function for all people because we now we see that uh, uh, we have uh, use guarantee, we have uh, this guarantee for a long uh, term unemployment, etc. But the basic things that the labor market have to function for all category of workers. Okay. Manuela, then in the case of the youth guarantee, is it, is it uh, approaching the time when we have an elderly guarantee for the workforce as well? <laughs> <laughs> this I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Would you think that'd be reasonable? Well, I think we life expectancy is is uh, is becoming bigger and bigger, right? So I think we need to think how we organize our work in a way that we can carry it out also longer in uh, in uh, in life. So I think we need to adapt the way. The way we work, this is certainly a, a, a question, and uh, and um, and and that's how we. Uh, but to have a, a guarantee for work, you mean? A guarantee for for <laughs> a work-life balance for those who are over seventy, over eighty, in the same way we have for those who are under thirty. A work-life balance. 
maybe it's more about life and not about work. We shall finish on that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me summarize. Today we've spoken about the segregation in the labour market, the poverty particularly of older women who suffer disproportionately as they lose out on the growth of their pension package uh, to a massive 39% uh, drop uh, as, as time goes by. Loss of talents in the, the workforce, loss of talents to employers who need to fill skills gaps and the capacity for entrepreneurship being underexploded in Europe in general but especially for women who find the flexible arrangements of work uh, more suitable at times and uh, the capacity for us to have a baseline for care services uh, that allow men and women to adapt and become more flexible in their working lives. Their fathers uh, can take greater responsibility for the family as well from a much earlier stage. And the shorter working days as a capacity uh, to deal with the surplus uh, work uh, uh, that is growing in Europe and will increase as automation uh, increases also. And the frustrating lack of sanctions against countries that don't uh, meet the criteria that have been set across Europe uh, and uh, also that contract transparency is something that uh, should be on the radar for the future. Malta leads with his example of universal childcare and uh, our capacity to work longer will draw this argument out further as we seek an elderly guarantee. Let me thank our guests today on the programme. Malin Bjork, MEP from Sweden, to the left, Manuela Galeng from the European Commission, Vladimira Drabalova from uh, the Economic and Social Committee and our excellent student today, uh, Sunchina Durica from uh, Croatia. I'm Brian Maguire. Thank you all so much.